The first two parts of this tutorial took place almost exclusively in particle illusion as we animated the offset for the video layer to remove camera motion and again as we animated the emitter itself so that it accurately tracked the soccer ball. This third and final part of the tutorial, yay, will take place in After Effects where we will composite the animated emitter with the original DV footage and mask certain elements of the video so that the emitter can take its proper place in the scene. Back in After Effects, I need to import the particle image sequence that was exported from Particle Illusion. Go to File, Import, File, and in the dialog box that appears, select the first PNG image in the sequence, which is Ball Trail 001. Ensure that the Import As control shows footage and that the PNG sequence box is checked. Click Open to import the file. Notice that after importing that the image sequence is assigned a frame rate of 60 frames per second. That's due to a preference setting in After Effects, so the sequence's frame rate must be manually changed for this project. Select the image sequence in the project panel and go to File, Interpret Footage, Main. Type 29.97 into the Assume This Frame Rate text box and then click OK to save the change. Switch to the Ball Trails Final Comp and drag the new image sequence to the composition. Rename the layer to Emitter. Notice that it has an unpleasant intense orange color and glow. To fix that, and make it look like it did in Particle Illusion, toggle the modes and switches, and click on the Mode drop-down list and choose Add. Recall that we created a 648 by 480 square pixel emitter in Particle Illusion because Particle Illusion only understands square pixels. The theory is that square pixel footage of those dimensions will composite perfectly when added to a composition that is 720 by 480 with non-square pixels. To demonstrate how theory can match up quite nicely with reality, I'll scrub the clip. Notice how the emitter tracks the ball in the DV-sized composition just as it did in Particle Illusion. Patience and determination test number three. Scrub forward in the comp to time 108. The emitter, whose layer in the composition is necessarily on top of the video layer, appears to be closer to the audience than the blue-shirted player. This isn't right because the ball is currently farther away than the blue-shirted player. Put bluntly, this situation completely ruins the effect. To fix it, we need to mask the emitter in those areas where it overlays the player in the clip. Select the emitter layer. Grab the pen tool and make sure Roto Bezier is checked. Add points to the mask in a rough outline of the player's body. Make sure to include enough control points so that you can animate the arm and leg shapes independently. I'll use the head, shoulder, one side of the hand, the other side of the hand, armpit, hip, knee, heel, toe, in between the legs, heel, toe, knee, hip, armpit, one side of the hand, the other side of the hand, shoulder, and then I'll close the mask by clicking on the initial control point over the head. Press the M key to twirl down the mask properties. Set the mask mode to subtract. Press Shift F to reveal the mask feather parameter. Set the mask feather to 16. Click the stopwatch for mask path to allow animation of the mask. Switch to the selection tool and click on the emitter layer in the timeline. This will allow adjustment of the individual control points and not just the whole mask. Adjust the mask control points to mask out the ball glow and ball trail from behind the player but not so much that all reflections on the skin and clothes are blocked out.
go back one frame. I need to adjust the mask again. I'll need to keep doing this until I get back to time one second when the emitter first arrives at the edge of the blue shirted player. Then I'll need to advance beyond time 108 and continue adjusting the mask until the end of the clip. This is the third and final test of your patience and determination. For the most part, animating the mask is a frame-by-frame -frame operation. As the player moves during the clip, I won't need to adjust each and every control point in every frame, and I may need to move some control points out of the way in an exaggerated manner so that they don't interfere with the proper masking of the emitter. You may encounter some situations where none of the mask control points need to be changed over the course of several frames, but those situations are the exceptions. Even then, the tween frames may not look quite right, and additional keyframes will be required. That's the wonderful world of rotoscoping, and I don't know any shortcuts to get around it. The Roto Bezier mask and large value for mask feather should make the job easier, but it's still going to take some work. Fortunately for this tutorial, I can advance in time to where the mask is completely animated and we can see the results right away. The only small issue that is left is what to do with the mask before it's needed at time one second. I don't want the mask to accidentally remove parts of the emitter or its particles in earlier parts of the clip. Normally, my first thought would be to animate the mask's opacity, but that won't work in this case. What I did to fix it was to animate the mask expansion parameter, starting with a large negative number and a hold keyframe at time zero, then setting a keyframe with a value of zero at time one second. Let's RAM preview the clip, composited with the emitter, and masked to give the illusion of proper depth in the scene. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? We're done. Now, if you create this effect in your production, make sure to explain to the audience that the ball wasn't really on fire, otherwise you may get a call from Defects. This has been Jeff Belyun, guiding you through the long and treacherous path to tracking and rotoscoping excellence using particle illusion and after effects. So long.